Employed background materials for introduction to Toastmasters mentoring. Explain that coaching and mentoring are actually very different. <coughs> coaching can be part of mentorship, but mentors are not coaches. Over the years, both in his career and in Toastmasters, Lloyd Smith has been coached and mentored at various times. Are they really different? And is coaching merely a subset of mentoring? This evening, Lloyd will finish level two in the visionary communication path by answering those questions. Lloyd Smith, some say tomato, some say tomato. Lloyd. This project, Introduction to Toastmasters Mentoring, is another really interesting one. The material's very well done. Some of you are gonna get a chance to do this because it is a required project for five of the 11 available paths in level two. The interesting thing about it is that uh, rather than what the project promises, it doesn't talk much about mentoring and being a protege in terms of outside life. Almost everything in here is related to Toastmasters, which is fine, because after all, we are here at Toastmasters. But the most amazing thing I saw was on page 10 of this material when it said mentors and coaches are often thought of as having similar roles. The two positions can overlap, but are actually very different. Coaching can be part of mentoring, but mentors can never be coaches. My initial reaction to that was that it's nonsense. I, I just don't believe it. I spent 15 years coaching high school debate, or roughly 250 or 300 debaters during that time period. And to me, the mentoring and coaching blurred together to the extent that I couldn't separate them. I think that's probably true of most teacher, student, or coach, participant relationships. And I, but I began to think about this in the context of Toastmasters. And I can think of two illustrations that might make my thoughts about this maybe a little more clear to you and maybe to myself too, because frankly, I'm still a little puzzled by that. Right now I'm coaching somebody in Toastmasters, not somebody in this group. It's a guy named Frank Briggs, who is the District 9 entrant uh, in the international speech contest. He won our district contest a few weeks back. In fact, Mary uh, Syri was one of the judges of that. And now he's getting ready to find out whether he's qualified through the video quarterfinal round to be in the live semifinals of the international conference. He won't know that for two or three weeks now. now. This is an interesting relationship Frank and I have. He's been a Toastmaster longer than I have, probably three or four years longer than I have. I've competed against him a bunch of times in speech contests. The last time we competed together, he beat me very narrowly in the international contest. I think, Eric, you and Christina, you were there too, weren't you? They beat me. I tended to agree with the judges, although lots of people in the room did not. But Frank, coaching Frank is an interesting experience because he has a lot of ability and a lot of experience in contests. Uh, I've done better. I've beaten him all but once when we competed head to head, but that really doesn't matter in this context. Uh, Frank is not a very good speech writer. He's a really good speaker, and in fact, that's how he beat me the last time he did so. He had a high energy delivery. I had a much better written speech, and all other things being equal, an energetic delivery will beat good writing, and that's exactly what happened. As we've been working together, most recently over the weekend, uh, he sends me drafts that he's working on. I send him my comments. He sends me another draft, having ignored most of my comments. I call him <laughs> and explain to him why I think he should consider what I've said. He usually says, oh, I get it now. Then he incorporates them, sends me a draft. I send him more comments, and so on and so on. This has gone back and forth. One problem with Frank is that he thinks that it's possible to do good contest speeches more or less just based on emotion off the cuff. It's really not. You have to have a speech and then figure out how to make it sound like you're spontaneous, not just be spontaneous. Um, and he's having trouble with that. So I've been trying to teach him how to draft speeches as opposed to just come up with a speech at the moment. Uh, I've been unsuccessful in that, generally speaking, although his speech is much better now than it was. He had some structural issues in his speech and speech or writing or writing in general is my academic background. My master's degree is in rhetorical theory and composition studies. 
Um, but that relationship is a coaching relationship. There is no mentoring involved. I don't think Frank would tolerate it, and I really don't want to try to do it because I know it would fail. Now, on the other hand, like three or four years ago, uh, I competed in our district international contest, got whacked by a guy named Mike Anthony from one of the Yakima clubs. Mike is a very interesting guy. He got into Toastmasters as part of a prison club while he was serving a five-year sentence. And then after he got out, he joined one of the clubs in Yakima. He had a compelling story for his contest speech about how Toastmasters, in his view, literally saved his life. Not just made his life better, but literally saved it. And that speech was good enough to win the contest. There's no doubt about that. Afterwards, I did what I usually do at the international contest at the district level. If I like the person, I offer to help him get ready for the next level. And he eagerly accepted. Now, the, the difference between Frank and Mike is that Mike knew that his speaking was limited by his prison experience. And so he was eager to be coached. He would try, he's the most coachable person I ever worked with at the high school level or at Toastmasters. Whatever I would suggest, he would try. If it didn't work, he would apologize and tell him, well, it didn't work. That means find something new to do. Uh, we probably spent maybe 30 or 40 hours together totally working on his speech. He ended up finishing third in his semi-final round at the uh, International Convention in Las Vegas, which is a, a very good result. Now, why I, I slowly became his mentor as we went along. And I think that's because he had what I told him the very first time we spoke. He had a lot of raw power. The trick was keeping the power and losing the rawness. And he managed to do that. Now, if you've never heard this guy speak, this won't make much sense. But he is a big guy in every sense. That Derek not only competed against him, beat him in the division. A uh, humorous speech contest. Mike says he will never forgive me for helping Derek. <laughs> hey, he's like going by. Anyway. He's physically a large guy, he's got a big personality, big voice, big movement, big everything. And that can be overwhelming at certain times. He doesn't know how to moderate himself, and he's a lot better than he was, believe it or not. But he will never change, it's just part of his basic personality. Now, I was his coach, but became his mentor. I think they can overlap. In fact, in some cases, I think they have to overlap. As I read this whole uh, description of this project again this afternoon, it seemed more puzzling to me than the first time I read it that they would say that mentors cannot be coaches. Of course they can, and in many ways they have to.